So thank you um, so much uh, for being here and having a hopefully great conference. Um, we had a, never had a, such an exciting turnout to our various events, uh, but now it is really time to honor the best and brightest of the field in information systems. And we would like to welcome AIS President AIS and AIS Fellow Award Committee Chair to the stage, TP and Ellen Dennis, please. Thank you, Jane and Helmut, for such a wonderful conference. Uh, at this point in the conference, we take time to recognize those outstanding people who are role models for the field. And I'm going to invite TP, who is chair of the Fellows Committee and past president, to do the honors. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. And uh, it's uh, really my pleasure to chair the uh, AIS Fellow Committee uh, to select eight outstanding scholars to be the recipient of this year's Fellow Award. The AIS Fellow Award recognizes individuals who have made outstanding contributions to the information system discipline in terms of research, teaching, and uh, services. They have made significant contributions toward the information system discipline as well as uh, their local services and local communities. So AIS fellows are role models and inspiration to colleagues and students uh, in our areas. So please all come to the stage as I announce your name. Uh, Andrew Burton Jones. Casey Urquhart. <laughs> Guo Qing Chen. <laughs> Yan Wong Pro. <laughs> Jane Webster. <laughs> Jason Teacher. <laughs> Ramesh Shada. <laughs> Robert. Davison. Congratulations to all of you. Congratulations. I would like to invite Hella Zinner, Zinner Henriksen to the stage to help me present the next awards. Each year, AIS recognizes those who have made important and innovative strides in information systems education by awarding three different awards to deserving candidates here at ICIS. The winner of the AIS Award for Outstanding Contribution to IS Education 
goes to Keng Xiao of, the, of Missouri University of Science and Technology. Keng is unable to join us today, but we are happy to celebrate him. The AIS Award for Innovation in Teaching recognizes innovation in teaching approaches and techniques and pedagogy, as well as in delivering courses and programs. This award specifically focuses on the uniqueness and innovativeness that increases student interest and derives achievement. This year's Innovation in Teaching Award goes to Wu He of Old Dominion University. Is Wu here? I will take that as a no, then we will move on. The AIS Award for Best Conference Paper in IS Education recognizes the importance of pedagogy research in the IS field. Papers that focus on IS education related topics at any AIS sponsored or affiliated conference are eligible for the award. The winners go to Can We Trust Teaching Evaluations When Response Rates Are Not High? Implications from a Monte Carlo Simulation by Jun He and Lee Freeman. Guess neither of them are here. <laughs> the AIS Early Career Award recognizes individuals in the early stages of their careers who have already made outstanding research, teaching, and service contributions to the field of information systems. As I call your name, please come to the stage. Please help me in congratulating Christian Meyer, Jean, Jean Lee, Hai Leung Chen, King Tao Kim, Leong Fei Shui, Miguel Goodhinho de Mateos, Tim Winkler, and Xiao Xiao. And next is the AIS Doctoral Student Service Award, which recognizes volunteer contributions made by doctoral students towards the success of AIS conferences, journals, and programs. 
Please help me in congratulating this year's winners. As I call your name, please come to the stage. Safa Abu Jabal. <clears throat> Maheshwar Bujraj. John Korea. Nikolai Kazantsev. <laughs> Fei Liao. <laughs> and Yenren Yao. Thank you very much for everyone who has made such outstanding contributions to our field. And now I'll invite Jane back up on stage. Today we're so honored to be joined by leaders in the field of information systems to discuss inclusive leadership in a digital world. Our panel consists of Ursula Mergenstern, the CEO of Atos, and Christine Haupt, head of Microsoft Enterprise Services in Germany. Ursula Mergenstern joined Atos in 2002 through the acquisition of KPMG Consulting. In 2018, she was appointed CEO of Atos Germany, the largest European IT service integrator with more than 110,000 employees in 73 countries. In 2016, she won the prestigious title of Woman of the Year at the Woman in IT Awards in recognition of both her success and her dedication to promoting diversity in technology. Christine Haupt is responsible for the service business of Microsoft Germany. This includes both the consulting and the premier support business. She reports to Sabina Bandiak, CEO of Microsoft Germany. Currently, she's a member of the executive board of Microsoft Germany, and in addition, she's a sponsor of diversity and inclusion at Microsoft Germany. Please join me in welcoming Ursula and Christine to the stage. We're here today to talk about inclusive leadership. So my first question to our two guests is, what does it mean to be inclusive in a digital world? For me, uh, inclusion means being able to bring groups of people and employees together, uh, which are coming from very, very different backgrounds. For digital technologies to succeed in business, IT has moved out of the back office of the ERP, where essentially, you know, IT was only used by one specific group of people. If you want to, like the finance people, and, and of course, um, or you had the sales people needing to use their sales system, what you now need to do with digitization, because you're changing the way how business operates, you need to bring IT together, finance, 
sales, engineering, if you're dealing in a manufacturing company. Um, and that actually is challenging leadership because you have to bring diverse teams together. And we as humans, we love to work with people who are similar to us. So managing diverse teams is a key skill uh, in succeeding in digitalization uh, in companies because it requires us to bring the best out of people who have very, very different thinking styles. And I just wanted to, I completely agree, but I just wanted to add another angle to, to that. Um, from a Microsoft perspective, um, if we actually want to go out there and create solutions, services that basically empower everybody, every person and every com company on the, on the planet to actually achieve more, it means that in our workforce we have to make sure that, the, that it is a reflection of the diversity of the world. So if you, and especially if it comes to machine learning, if it comes to artificial intelligence, if it comes to new, to new systems, if you don't reflect in your workforce the diversity that you're actually aiming for, for the greater good of society or for, for, for the new products and the innovations you want to create, um, you're definitely missing out um, the, the, the point because the different perspective, the different, different ideas, the different angles you get from a diverse workforce and diversity not just in the means of gender but also in the, the means of ethnic background, about in the means of culture, of um, all different um, aspects that actually count into a diversity, diverse and inclusion, in inclusive en environment. I think that's the beauty and actually that's the, the long-term success you will have in developing new, s new systems if you are able to reflect that in your own workforce. Just perhaps um, you just triggered my uh, another thought. I mean, we are in a time of extreme change and change will only accelerate and innovation will be critical for many companies and many businesses to succeed and creative teams, diverse teams are better creative teams and I mean research have shown that um, if you bring different people together ideas will flow and therefore again being able to manage that I think yeah. is what we need yeah. to learn. Yeah. Absolutely and there's, there's, there's another angle and I think that's, that's the interesting thing about when we talk about diversity and inclusion that there's usually there are different angles to that and different really different points I think you, we, need to, we need to consider. And another one is if you talk about digital, digitalization, there is a huge opportunity in, in there also in regards of your how we work together. So I think if, I mean, the first thing is always the, the, you need to foster the mindset and you need to allow as a leader to actually work with a diverse, diverse um, group of people. But then the technology actually is a huge enabler. Um, to create more flexible working environments, especially, for example, for, for parents, if you're a part-timer, if you can't be in the office all the time, if you allow your company or your working environment to be flexible, to actually use technology so that people can work in different times, can work in virtu virtual groups, can work um, from home, from ev everywhere. And the technology is there, there to do that. But it also needs a lot of... I would say courage and trust from the leadership and management to actually enable that, that kind of. So the technology is one thing to, that, that helps you, but the mindset um, to actually foster that, that's the call for the leadership. How would you identify and develop inclusive leaders that would be able to do those kinds of things? Um, I think you need to again, as all good leadership development looks at um, the various um, competence areas of, of, a, of a leader. One is, of course, you know, um, the, the factual and the, the competence, but also, I think, how is, is training awareness? Uh, and one is, and a lot of companies nowadays, will train awareness about cultural differences thinking style differences, because again, we are, uh, but also about biases. One of the big trainings running in all companies nowadays is bias training, because we are not aware of our bias, or even if we know that we have a bias, we don't know, we, we can't do anything against it. Um, and, and really being therefore aware of um, the, the people you manage, I think increasing that awareness is one of, 
um, of the key training points at the moment in, in developing people, but also, of course, in the promotion process, you need to reward this type of behavior. So, of course, the commercial se success is one, but also how good are you as a leader? And most big companies, I would say, are now looking also at employee satisfaction and team feedback as one of the components into the development of people. So it's really giving, I would say, the ability to manage people uh, a focus in, 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 the, in the leadership process. So, and I think it's also a question how you define leadership. I mean, we, we actually, if we, we, when we talk about leadership, we, we don't make the equation that a leader is a manager or a senior, senior person. So we expect um, each and every uh, employee and person who, who works in, in our company to be a leader of diversity in, in, in inclusion, to actually foster an environment that everybody can bring out the best. And we have a saying that it's um, come as you are, do what you want and be the best who you, you can be at, at work and to actually foster that environment. Um, I think it's not just a leader um, obligation to do that and it's something that we need to incorporate in our, in our daily doing and also bring it on top of our agenda in the middle of the, of the organization. And um, so what we, for example, what we did um, um, two years ago was actually that we changed, so we do, we do quarterly, um, development um, reviews with each of our employees and um, we completely changed that that talk from making one of our core priorities for each and everybody is diversity and inclusion. So when we do those reviews with, with, the, with, with the individuals, um, we talk about not only, and that was kind of like the, 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 the former, former one, about the impact that the individual has in, con in, in his daily work, but we also talk about um, how do you actually support others to be successful in, 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 in our company? And then the, the third one is, um, how do you build on the work of others? So how do you leverage of what other people have actually already contributed to make it even greater on that? And then the first one, and there's no order in that, but in the first one is, what's your personal contribution to, to actually foster a diverse and inclusion environment in, around that? So I think if, if, if you consider that leadership is in kind of like an oblique, uh, something that, that sits in each and every body of us and not just on the top level, and I'm not, I, mean, I think we might come to that one, I think it always starts on the top, but um, I think it's also important to have that as a continuous through the full organi organization, but yeah, setting the tone of the, the, the tone at the top um, is probably the most important thing. Could I, I mean this sounded, I was listening to, to us and I, I know Christina you won't take it uh, personally, I thought we are sounded very fluffy at the moment and I, I have a problem with all this talk actually about inclusivity, diversity, in the, I've been part of this debate since over 10 years and I'm getting bored because nothing is, ch oh, the, the change is so slow, so slow. Uh, <laughs> I can recommend that you regularly, I mean, there are two or three data sources which are giving us data um, consistency. One is the World Economic Forum, and the other one is McKinsey actually does uh, uh, Women Matter, uh, which, which goes broader than um, just women and gender diversity. But essentially, they just published their 2019 report. And yes, we have 24% more women on sea level, 13% more senior managers are committing to, um, um, you know, to diversity in whatever shape and form. But in reality, uh, hardly any significant change, you know, a bit of change, under 5% change on female board representation, under 5% change of women of color in senior positions, no real change at all as far as women considering barriers in companies to, um, to advancement and essentially still a lot of women who are the only woman. Um, one out of five women are uh, normally the only woman in, in a team, in an environment. Uh, in technology, it's two out of five. And if you're a black, black woman, you're essentially, um, you know, that's, that's even higher. 
when we, we often often also talk, and I, I just get a few of the facts out because we're also a lot of the debate and therefore is about women advancement promotion in technology that that is the problem. But we have so many women now, Accenture is led by women, IBM is led by a woman. Um, I mean, we have a fair number of women at the top. So when they are being, when they're in the company, we don't have a promotion issue in technology. We struggle to attract women to the industry. So our pi we have a pipeline problem at the very entry stage. And then the next problem is uh, being hired, uh, sorry, being promoted the first time. So again, if you look at the data, that's where the problem in technology is. And I always say we have an image problem. Why, uh, why don't women want to join the technology industry? Why don't women want to study math or technology, informatics? That's where our problem starts because we then as companies, the pool of people we can hire is extremely, extremely low. So for me, as you see, actually going back to what, what I think do we need to do to be diverse, you know, to, to ensure inclusive and diverse leadership, we need to start to look at numbers. And we really need to have data and saying, what is the data telling us about our behavior in the company? What is the data telling me about this manager? Does he actually have always the same type of people in, you know, his mates, his, the people he likes, people who are similar to him? Or can we see that he is actually, is the data telling us that he is paying equally, that he's promoting fairly? And that's for me the thing. So after 10 years in this, I'm just saying, let's not fool ourselves. Let's look at the data. Let's look at what is the data telling us and then take hard measures. So if we are underpaying women, let's pay them equally. If we are not promoting women, let's look at our promotion processes, look at our promotion panels. Because funny enough, if you only have a male panel and we hire in our self-image, guess who is getting promoted? And I've seen that again and again. So at this, uh, and, and sorry for, for being now in the preachy, because I thought, uh, we will become, it's, it's really, we just need to do something different and continue just to talking about it will not make the slightest difference. Yeah, and I'm absolutely with you. Um, just to, just to add, on, add on that, um, I think you're completely right. We need to look at data, and, but that also means we have, to, we have to incorporate that in our daily leadership work. So if it's just a checkbox you do at the end of your, you have a long board meeting and at the end you kind of check on your, on your diversity numbers, I think that will never change actually to become kind of like in the middle of your organization. So there is a lot of things um, we see that you need to do through the full set of your organization to actually get the, get the mindset shift in your organization, how valuable it is to have a diverse and, uh, and inclusive um, um, workforce. And then absolutely right, you need to have some controls in place. And um, for example, we even, we even have like parts of our compensation model as leaders sits actually on those, on those numbers. And there's a very s sort sorrow proce process um, how we track and, and work with that. And I think that it's not just the control, but it also, if you, if you put it on your daily agenda, and then I think that's the most important talk, one, walk the talk in there. And I think that's the other thing. We see a lot of um, very male-dominated or non-diverse environments. As I, as I said, we, 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 in regards of diversity, we look to different angles, not just to the, to the gender part. And then you see, see there's a lot of discussion on that. But um, we, we also know that role modeling is so important. So, and um, just to add a, a few data, we did a, we did a study a couple, two, two years ago about, um, so how do we actually capture the, 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 the inspiration and the ambition of young girls to move into, into IT? And uh, that study, in, uh, it was a European study, actually showed that there's a window of opportunity where you can influence, attract, and inspire um, girls to actually, to actually pursue a career in technology. 
and the window is it's closing at around 15 16 so if you are able to uh, to to engage um, girls between 8 and 15 or 16 and get them inspired on technology you have a a, a, a a good chance that they will actually pursue their career in that. But if you miss that part, um, you can hardly turn them, turn them around. And one of the, the key influencer for girls at that age is do, how do they relate to technology? Is there a role model in their, in their environment? And a role model could be a mother who is working in, 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 in science or technology, someone they know, someone from, 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 from um, a, f a female role model. Also, in schools, do they see female leaders in technology actually showing up there and um, in, in, their, in their usual train, um, classes um, is the talk about the great, the great inventors or are they also talking about the great female inventors in there. So if they, if they can, can connect to role models, um, you can catch their, their, their um, inspiration and their ambition. And also a an, an, uh, second one is um, do they see the, the, the higher purpose? So this study also showed that um, you, the, the interest in actually the algorithm and the machine learning and the deep learning and whatever is not that much, it's not that what they're actually looking for. It's, is there a purpose behind that? So if we change our, how we, and I think that comes to, to the image problem as well. So if we, if we change our, our behavior, how we talk about science, how we talk about technology, and actually make the connection points to the, to the higher purpose, the, what you can actually achieve with them, how, how you can change the, the influence, the impact you have of, of, on society, on health, on, 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 on the things that actually matter to, 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 to people, um, it's also a chance to get them influenced. So, but why I'm pointing that out, because I think the, the audience here, um, in regards to how we, how we role model, how we actually put, put ourselves in front of um, the, the entry point level, which is actually the school, and then certainly um, the, the how you attract females to a university plays a huge role for, for us in regards of the future workforce. So I, I would agree that um, looking at the, how do we, I think there need to, needs to be more than one path into um, technology and into, for, for women or for, um, let's say, minorities as well, if, or uh, current. But if we, um, because how do we get more girls interested? And I think it's the schoolwork which we need to do. I always, um, always wonder also how I managed to end up in, um, technology uh, in a fairly senior role. I studied um, ad business administration and you might be delighted to know I studied organizational behavior and organizational psychology. And I ended up in technology running one of the biggest companies in Germany. So how did that happen? Uh, and it was actually one of my organizational psychology courses where we were talking about how the computer, how you roll out a technology program or system in a company. And I really got interested in how is IT and technology impacting the performance of a business. And then I was lucky enough that um, my PhD, my, the, the student who looked after me, um, her boyfriend had just a startup in Germany about you know, an IT startup and she, they said, do you want to join? And everything else was taught to me when I was, uh, while I was, you know, starting to work. And that was for me, my entry into uh, the technology industry. And I believe there is, that's the other entry point we need to start to look at or can look at. Because if I look at a company like mine, we need technology people but we need also technology people which understand business. And there is no job out there this, you know, in the ne years to come, there is no job out there which does not involve technology. Be you a journalist in media, in, um, let's say, in a, in a factory job in Germany with automation, uh, with, with the level of automation already existing. If you're driving a cab, if you're driving a truck, all of these jobs are impacted 
by technology and will use technology. So instead of saying there's only one right way to end up in technology, which is, is sometimes the discussion is also going, yes, every girl has to learn to code. Yes, I agree, it would be really, really good. But if they haven't done that, if we have missed them when they are in that uh, 15 to 16 year age range, how about making sure that at university or higher education they're also exposed to technology in the same way as this lucky incident brought me towards technology. Why? Uh, and that's for me another opportunity for academia to really think how they move out of my IT uh, studies into uh, and, and really make it exciting for a journalist to become interested in, in IT and I'm using journalism or languages because these are of course or marketing very very popular subject matters people like to girls like to study marketing is full of IT nowadays you can't do that job without IT and therefore again that's for me another option to consider how do you move out of the IT departments into the other fields of study and therefore increasing the access or the reach we have towards women so um, you've talked a little bit about your personal journey into the field Christine, can you tell us a little bit about your personal and professional journey? Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm actually, so I, so I started, I, I had some talents in, in mathematics and, and, um, um, and physics, and um, I, so I studied physics, um, but there was a f one, one, I think, <laughs> hurdle I needed to take first because I had a physics, a physics teacher who actually taught me that girls can study physics when I uh, was asking him about my... my my idea of going out and, and study physics. So um, it actually encouraged me more than it um, <laughs> pushed me away. But I think it was more than 25 years ago. I hope that's not the case anymore at schools. Um, but any, anyhow, um, I think that the other, the other interest piece, so during my studies and my PhD, I was already um, um, working with, with IT systems, um, partly developing software as, as well. Um, but when I, when I applied for my first job in the IT industry, um, I actually declined that job, job offer because I felt it was so technical. And I think that comes to your point. Um, I mean, the, 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 the reason um, why I came into IT was certainly not the, the technology itself. Um, it was the, the higher purpose because as I thought um, I was working in the, in the medical um, research before and I, I always felt that you can make a difference by using technology, but it was not the technology itself. And the first interviews I had in my, in my applying for my first job, they were all male, um, highly technical, and I just felt this is going to be a really boring environment. Uh, that's, that's not where I, want, where, where I want to spend my time. And then um, luckily there was, and, and sometimes I, I think there's, there's always um, a bit of luck involved, there was um, someone who saw me doing the interview put, um, process and he came back and he said, you know what, um, we, I really would like to have you on the team because everything else you bring with you. And so it was more about the personality, it was about all what we usually call the, the soft skills and also the parts, parts of what I was interested in to make a dif difference. And that's how I started out in, in IT, so it was, it was actually, I, dec I, I declined the, f the first one. But I think there's, there's another interesting, interesting thing that I like to point out. When I, and all my career I was working in a very, um, well, male dominated environment, but I didn't feel uh, for a long time like that, that's actually something that, that's bothering me, me a lot. But then in, in during the, the, the course of my career, I realized that um, as a female leader, you have some obligation to actually role model in there, to influence, to show, to show, to, to get, um, to, to participate and, and influence um, the society and um, the, the companies um, about diversity. And um, in, when I joined Microsoft a couple of years ago, um, I was, it was the first time for me that I actually had a, a way more diverse in, in environment, and not just about the, the gender in my management team, but also about uh, the ethnic background um, and um, people from all, all over the world. And it amazed me, it, it personally amazed me how much different it makes to my, how I show up at work, 
how I um, en enjoy being being with my, my team, um, but also what it what it, what it uh, the opportunities I have by actually um, taking in different perspective and different different opi opinions, and um, so I think that's the other thing you, you once you. You need to experience that that for yourself, and also um, there is uh, to me, and that's probably to the female audience in here. I think there's a huge uh, huge um, call out for female role modeling, so um, to actually um, get on stage and get involved. And um, so coming back to my first point, so that, that so that there's someone to you can you can look and relate to. Research is actually showing that if you have one woman on a board or a management team, it doesn't make such a difference you need to have three women to actually for a culture change to come through so the so lonely woman um, is, is just not as um, effective in, in driving the change as um, as having um, yeah. you know three yeah, ab absolutely and I think that's that's actually when you see that the, the how much different it makes when uh, as long as you are the only one on a, on a board or in a, in a team it's kind of like you're the lonely wolf in there um, a, as soon as you as you have a higher share in there and right now my management team is 50 50 um, by, by gender um, you really s see what it what it means to have a diverse team so uh, the audience here, obviously, being very, uh, very interested in academia, what role can or should we as academics play as a scholarly community concerned with information systems? I mean, we, uh, as I said, I'm actually, I th what I said before, so again, of course, you can go out to the schools and help also especially if you're female and study IT or uh, are teaching IT, is, is going out and reaching to the schools. And I think that's, um, and it's probably everybody can do that. There is for me still a lot of work to be done about the image of the industry. And uh, I sometimes wonder whether the movie Hidden Figures has done more um, to promote um, technology than many of us could have done um, an amazing movie showing um, computers where women calculating mathematics that was the division and uh, you know, the divi uh, name for for that team if you at have NASA. not seen it you should definitely see it see it's, it it's it's about black women um, uh, being behind the you know working in NASA calculating um, doing calculations for the NASA team uh, and essentially being influential of bringing um, us to the moon so, so that's, for me, there is an image, but the other one I'm really serious about is, is how do we broaden and how do we make it easier for women to start to get exposed um, during their studies to IT? Uh, because looking back, because that would, that would, um, would really help actually the business, uh, you know, that's a, I, from a diversity perspective or inclusive perspective would be helping. But if I really look at the problems we have going forward as a society, we really need to make sure that we have workforce anywhere and everywhere which understands digital technologies. And uh, I just give you German numbers. We have 80,000 open IT positions in Germany and the number is constantly growing because everything, you know, what BMW, Daimler doing with the, um, all the German manufacturers, the German banks, every German business needs people, with, needs, needs a workforce with an understanding of technology. And we just do not have enough of these um, people in our German workforce and I'm pretty sure the problem will be everywhere in the world. So again, for me, the question to academia is how do you define, um, that? that's number one, how do you broaden the reach? And the second big problem is constant learning. Our workforce is between 40 and 50 years old. They have been growing up with um, technologies the younger generation um, will have vaguely heard of. But of course, we all constantly now need to learn about the new topics. So a reskilling and tra constant reskilling and re-education re in that sense becomes a topic, a real serious business topic for us. So again, for me, academia, if you can help me, these are the two topics I would give you uh, as homework. <laughs> yeah, um, I would 
I will, would definitely put the two ones in your homework as well, and I p would probably add um, um, one that comes to how you actually train your people, because what what and and I think it relates to the first point you 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 were making, um, the way how we how you train people to be to come out of university with a diverse and inclusive mindset, but also to be able to to be, be someone who is not kind of like taking his personal identity out of how much do I know, um, but also how much can I actually learn from others, how much can I, can I um, build on others, how much can I contribute to success of others, and being able to actually learn and, and considering learning as something that's ongoing for your lifetime now. And I think that's that's what we when we look to people coming out of university, especially from technical studies, they they, they kind of like identify themselves very much about the knowledge they have, and less about um, the contribution they they can do and the the team working and um, the the mindset they bring to to uh, to, uh, to to their daily daily work. I think that's that's the other thing that I w I would add. And uh, I mean, we have talked about your role in in actually making sure that you reach out um, to to school environments as well and attract fe females. And um, I think the the image image point is um, also highly highly important for for that. And just to add on a little bit, because this is a research conference, are there any particular topics that the IS research community should be working on yeah. to try to assist in this area? I, I find the world of diversity inclusion very uh, research-free. There's hardly any data, any good data which you, um, the, the data sources, and therefore we are having this. Um, so, so again, in, in that sense, actually any research in, in any of the topics we are just discussing it is useful. Um, but also, of course, future technologies, if you're looking at is this really, is there a diversity bias, be it age, be it, um, you know, in, in AI, of course, is the topic which is very uh, topical at the moment about is it biased. But for me, it's actually, if we are talking, if anybody here in the audience is interested in inclusion and IT, is what are the research topics which can make a real difference because it's an opinionated debate since 10 years without really firm data points. And for me that makes management action, societal action, and a discussion of opinions, but not a discussion where we can really know, okay, what's the right measures to do? The reason why we haven't moved forward in inclusivity so much in technology is because nobody really knows what action and what management measure really works. And that's for me uh, an error on trial process which we are, we are having. So I think research is there. <laughs> research, please. I would I just um, underpin the, and you just mentioned the, the artificial intelligence. So if I look to, to new technology, I think the, the AI piece is um, something, especially if it comes to, to research on um, how we can actually make sure in using a AI going forward that there is no bias in there, what the research on the, on the data sets we need and, and um, how we can let, make sure that the machine learning models we're, we're using, the algorithm are actually um, paying their, their I mean, actually diverse and in inclusive. I, I think that that's, that's one part and also how we, how we can use that new technology and that that's coming up to actually generate a more inclusive en environment. I think that that part is also. I mean, there is a lot of research going into it, but the purpose actually, how can, can can those systems actually serve the greater need of society? I think that area of research is also of high high interest, um, not only for companies like us, but also for the full for the full full society. I think yeah, that's um, digital, work, digital workplace has already changed the work, how, how we all can work. Flexible working, for example, remote working has, has changed the world, um, how we conduct business, but it also opens it up. In general, I would say, and that's not about inclusive leadership now in the sense of 
the rate of change will accelerate so much. So most of us will have in companies, and again, we are representing here the commercial world, will have problems to, it, uh, to take in that rate of change. Um, a system change in, uh, of an ERP system is a major disruption still for, for many companies. Um, the amount, what technology can do and what people actually do in their day-to-day -day work life, we are trailing behind the potential. And therefore, my other um, wish would be to say, how do you, when you start to think about the innovations and the research are we doing, it's also to look at how can it be actually um, taken up because it's, you know, we have great technology, but if it's not used by humans, then of course the value is vastly diminished. So for me, that is a challenge we will have going forward in the next 10 years, that wide range of population will be exposed to technology and not all of them um, will embrace it, will find it um, positive, but how do we therefore um, also, how do you help and research take up of technology from a human perspective. Well, thank you both very much. I know we're running out of time, but I have one, one last question. And what would be one specific piece of advice or a last thought you might want to share with the audience on this topic? <laughs> one last thought. Um, my, probably my, my advice or my last thought to diversity and inclusion is always, always um, it always starts with an I. So um, there's a lot of talk, of talk and, and you mentioned it about diversity and inclusion, but at the end it, it starts with, with the I. Um, so if I don't take diversity and inclusion, if I don't value that, if I don't put that on my personal agenda, if I don't foster an environment that's truly um, diverse and, and inclusive, if I just talk about that, but I still have a board, I still have a management team that's ma mainly male uh, dominated, I think it starts with the, with the eye, and um, that's probably my last thought on that. I would have um, actually said the same. I mean, it's setting, I set myself targets. Uh, you know, there's big debates about quotas or not, but if you look at France, France has now 42% of women on the board. Guess what, it was quotas which achieved that, they doubled within five years. I'm not saying set yourself a formal quota, but I, self my, I set myself always informal quotas. It doesn't need to be about women and men. Uh, the, the role I had previously was a global role in Atos. Uh, I had 32,000 employees. The vast majority was outside Europe and I had a pure European management team. So I set myself the quota that I would have at least half of my management team non-European. And I just told to the team that's what we aim for. And within two years, that was then achieved. So I think by setting myself and, my and being myself the quota and being very, very visible and vocal about it, it then permutated, of course, into the organization because it, when they were trying to promote a good white um, European, I said, we have already so many, we are not a fair representation of the team. So setting yourself your own agenda. And we have spoken here a lot because of the, <laughs> you know, both of us, of course, being female, about women. Uh, and uh, but in reality, the, the other interesting again, I'm a CEO, so I'm commercially minded. Um, ethnic diversity is actually a higher return of investment um, to a company than um, female male uh, diversity. So again, from from my perspective, is making sure that my company or my unit was representing the world and the consumers and our employees is something important, so again, but summary, set yourself a target as well, whatever that might be. So I'm, I'm sorry to say we're running out of time. Um, before we conclude the panel, I do want to put in a commercial. There is a senior scholar panel tomorrow that's going to take this conversation more internal to the association. So if you're interested in finding out more about 
diversity inclusion within AIS and within our own community, I'd urge you to come to the Senior Scholar Panel at 8.30 tomorrow morning. So anyhow, please join me in thanking these two very busy and very informative and very interesting women. Thank you so much. Before you, before you disappear, Christine and uh, Ursula, before you disappear, of course, could you take your heart? Thank you, thank you. So I can untangle it. Thank you. 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 Now for the next moment, there are two locations for the awards luncheon today, ICM room 14 and the AMZI. So if you find that one is already full, go to the other one. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.